Hello and welcome to Property Mastermind Podcast with Bob and Hillary, episode 84. Today, talking property development feasibilities. We're going to unpack these and it's going to be another fantastic episode that you won't want to miss. Let's jump on in. Hey, welcome to Property Mastermind Podcast episode 84 as I said and today giving away a copy of Property Millionaires Exposed. If you'd like a copy of this subscribe to our YouTube channel. We get a notification you go in the draw and you could be next week's winner. Last week's winner Oh, the winner for this week, I mean, is Paul Harrison. Paul, this book will be in the post to you. I will reach out for your address and you will receive a copy in the mail. And as Bob says, go straight to uh, page 121 where it's all about property development. Anyway, Bob, we're on. Uh, this episode's coming up January... 23. Yeah, but is it 19th? Ah, not the year. Mm, not sure. <laughs> January the 19th. Sounds good. I'm not sure. It's hard to know. We pre-recorded a few prior to Christmas. So, uh, yeah, that's about, must be about the 19th this will be out. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, that's pretty good. That's uh, about a week before Australia Day, roughly. It is a week before Australia Day. And as a Kiwi, I have to say, <laughs> I still celebrate well, Australia well, Day well. Well, you do. But a- any excuse for a celebration with you, I mean, I'm sure you... Uh, celebrate is it Waitangi Day or what, yeah, whatever it is in New Zealand? So Waitangi Day. Waitangi. Sorry. Waitangi. Mm. Waitangi Day. Uh, it is Waitangi Day. We were in. We just went inland a bit to check out some of Australia and went to Lismore. We did go to see Lismore, yeah, and talk to people, see how they're recovering down there. You, you did a bit of a walk up the street, talked to a lot of business owners. Certainly was eye opening when we saw how high that water went. I was shocked. Oh, I was shocked, and it was. Apparently two metres higher than the previous record. And remember I pulled out that chart off the internet of every flood level since 1870. So 150 years of floods. And, you know, there's quite a lot of floods around the same level. And and that was like heavy, big floods. And then 2022 was like off the chart. Oh, it was crazy. Probably only about 30% of businesses being back, would you say? Uh, Probably, yeah. We walked up and down the streets of Lisbon, dropped in and saw people who were Back in, back in business, and you had some good conversations, I know, with some of those people. Just finding out how it was for them, it was really interesting uh, what they, you know, how they recover, what they did. Mm. So you do our, bit, do our bit to sort of support the local economy. That's where I was heading. Remember oh. what I bought in Lisbon? Tell me. An Australian bikini for you Australia Day. For Australia <laughs> Day. The, um, with the Union Jack and the, um, yeah, well, it was very Australian, I'd have to say, for a Kiwi. I thought it was kind of funny. I what a New Zealand bikini looks like. Pretty much the same. Oh. It's just missing one of the stars. <laughs> oh, and there's a tra- the, the One of the Southern Cross stars is missing. And they're a different colour. Yeah, yeah, it would be. Yeah. Well, ours are transposed more, the other way. It? Although I just feel a bit more like an Australian these days. Mm. Well, you're here. Oh, I am here. <laughs> anyway, we're talking uh, uh, property development feasibilities. Mm. And this is stemmed out of a chat that Bob and I have every morning. We sit on the balcony and have our coffee together, discuss the plan for the day, and we just got talking about feasibilities, and you said, I think we need to do a podcast on this. Yeah, yeah, not so much a detail about how to do a feasibility, but, you know, about things to watch out for. I mean, Mm. we all know the importance of feasibility. I mean, property development is all about numbers, initially. Mm. You're so good with numbers, I can't, but your head's like a calculator. (laughs) <laughs> Does it look like a calculator or no, is it no? No, I'm just I'm pretty sure what goes on in there. I no. don't know. I'd, I, yeah, is, I'd like I, I am it. numbers orientated, but you yeah. don't have to be because you mm. know, as I've often said over the years to people who are looking at getting into property development, it it, it is about the numbers. It's about getting the numbers right, mm. but you don't have to be a great mathematician. I mean, it's probably level uh, year four maths. You know, we don't do any more than add up, subtract, multiply, and divide. Mm. And these days, of course, we've got feasibility programs. But it's all about understanding the, you know, the, the items, the different costs, if you like, that are involved and understand what they are and how much they are. Mm. Can I do an advert here? Great time to do one. This podcast is brought to you by Property Mastermind, Australia's leading and most experienced property development educators. 
How about that? Oh, great. Good so if you're interested, Spot on, though. Yeah. If you're interested in learning about property development, jump on over to our website, propertymastermind.com.au, or even reach out if you'd like to have a chat to me about what we offer. If 2023 is your year for property development, we're the people you want to be doing it with. So, yeah, reach out. We can have a chat, and or you can just jump straight on the website. Yep. Anyway, back to that, that was my advert. Great advert. You can see nothing here is scripted, is it? <laughs> it's, all pretty, it's all pretty, let's go. Off the cuff. But we do make a few notes and we've got some points we do want to mm. cover today with feasibilities. Yeah, well, feasibility, so sometimes called financial feasibility, but or number crunching, to use the slang. Or fizos. Or fizos, as we often say around the office. But property development is about numbers. In other words, you have to have your... It's a bit like a it's a bit like a profit and loss statement in a way. You know how you've got income mm. less all your expenditure equals your profit, and, and that's really what it is. It's it's no different. And so, uh, our our income, well, that's what we sell our properties for. Our costs, and there's quite a few costs. We have to add them up. We take them away. That's our profit. But it has to be enough. Mm. It has to be enough profit. Uh, to take the the time, the energy, the risk of doing a property development. Mm. I mean, ultimately, that's what financiers look for. They look for a particular profitability, a profit margin. They don't want to do, they don't want to fund something that just gets over the line and just makes a meagre profit. I think that's a great point there, Bob, and it's something that a lot of people don't understand, especially people that are new to property development. They think, well, I'm going to make, you know, 6% or I'm going to make it. A hundred thousand dollars on this, or two hundred thousand mm. dollars, but it's often more about whether a financier would loan money to that project. So unless you're paying cash, yeah. and so if you have to borrow money, a financier won't won't loan. They won't loan you that money, and that's something that a lot of people don't really understand. They think, oh, I could make fifty thousand dollars on that, but no one's going to loan you money because the risk would be too high because the the percentage of mm. of what it what it returns is too low. Yeah, and for those that aren't sort of aware when we're talking about profit margins, typically what we do as property developers, we do our numbers and we come up with a profit and we express our profit as a percentage of our total costs. And we like that depending on the type of project. If we were doing some townhouses, we might like it to be around 20%. So our profit as a percentage of our total cost 20. Something smaller, you know, something like a duplex in a good area might be around 15%. But that's that's what we talk about, return on cost, margin on cost. But yeah, it needs to be that number. And, and we let, let's say that uh, at a 20% margin makes us $400,000 on a particular project. And we might look at one that doesn't produce that margin. It might be more like 250000 rather than four hundred. And this is what you were just saying. Now, we might be really happy to make 250000 because we might be making, you know, seventy or 80000 out of our day job. Mm. We think, oh, I'd, I'd gladly do it for 250000 The problem is the financier would be expecting you to make that margin, that mm. 400000 and, and and you won't get the money. And remember, this is relative to the size of the project. Yeah, sure. I mean, a project might only... Um, you know, a fifteen percent project, depending on how the size of it, m- might return two hundred or one hundred thousand, and that's okay because it's about the percentage. It's not mm. really about that number that you're speaking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dollar value. So that's a that's a common thing we hear from people that are starting out. And they they do a project. It doesn't really. It's not a great one. It doesn't produce the required margin. But they just you know concentrate on that dollar profit and think mm. that's that's plenty for me. Yeah, not that, plenty for the finance. Yeah. Bit of a bit of a rookie. <laughs> so that's a really great thing to yeah. know if you're new to property development. So Bob, let's talk about how we get started mm. on, on a feasibility, often referred to as your five minute fizo or just it's just the five minute fizo. If you do, you want to break down what the be- yeah. what that is. What do you? So be- bearing in mind, like I just said a few minutes ago, that a feasibility is a bit like a profit and loss statement. So you got your income less your expenditure equals your profit. Your income's straightforward it's what we sell our duplex townhouses lots of land for and we often give that a technical name don't we known as the grv the grv gross realization value so the grv is what you sell everything for there Mm. you go people knew yep gross realization value and that that's just a number it's what it is it's what the market would pay for that product but then we got a number of costs so i do have a a, um, a simple way. 
just taking one step back, what can be very frustrating, particularly when people are starting out, is if they spend a lot of time looking at a project and in the end it, it doesn't stack up, as we say. Mm. It doesn't produce the right profit. But you could spend hours and hours or even days uh, you know, gathering information and doing feasibilities and talking to people and working out what the GRV is, only to find out it doesn't, doesn't even work. Mm. Now, you don't want to do that too often. What you want to do is have a quick way of working out Is it likely to work? And if it's likely, it's not an absolute, but if it's likely to work, then you could spend some more time on it. Mm. And that's where... That's why you use the five-minute FISO. That's it. That's what we have in probably most of them. We call it the five-minute FISO. And what it is, simple profit and loss type statement, it's your sale price, your GRV, less eight basic costs. And and they'd simply be things like, well, obviously the land, that's that's a big dollar item, the construction... That's a big dollar item. And then some smaller ones, things like consultants, council fees, marketing, finance, GST, and then a couple of bits and pieces. So people who followed our podcast would have heard that our recommendation when you're starting off is to choose an area and dig deep on it. Mm. A patch, what we call a patch. So you would have a pretty good idea uh, right at the beginning you know, what a three-bedroom townhouse is likely to sell for in your area. And uh, so that the GRV, yeah, look, you've got to get it right. It's the biggest number in our feasibility. It could easily be uh, twice or even two and a half times our construction cost. Mm. So a lot of people go very micro on the construction cost, not realising that, you know, it, the GRV is two and a half times. So on a, on a percentage error... Uh, if you're out, say, 5% on your GRV, uh, it's a lot more than being out 5% on your construction price, for instance. That surprised me this morning when we were discussing it. You, you brought that up. People focus way more on construction and less on GRV, and yet GRV will have a way bigger impact than the construction being wrong. There's yeah. a really good tip, peeps. Yeah. Listen to that one. <laughs> Look, quite often, uh, in, in, in a capital city... If we're talking something like townhouses, the land plus the construction, that's just two big cost items. They often equal around 80% of your total cost. So the other 20% of your costs is made up of things like I just mentioned, consultants fees, council fees, finance, marketing, GST, those bits and pieces. And so at the end of the day, there's only three numbers that really matter. And they're the three... For your five-minute FISO before you decide to spend time on a real FISO and go down the due diligence route and waste, like you said, Mm. a lot of time. Yep. I just had to pop pop that in there. So people will think, Bob said only this, and then you'll get one of those emails. No, no. That crazy lady from that time. The GRV, your land, what you pay for your land, for your site, and your construction costs are the big three items. And so you need to get them right. The other ones you need to get right too because... But, you know, the more accurate you can be, the better. But mm. they have, I guess what I'm saying, they have less influence on the outcome. Mm. If your consultant's fees, for instance, are 5% of your costs and you're 10% out or 20% out, even if you're 20% out, 20% of 5% is 1%. So you're only out by 1% of your costs. That's not going to make a big difference. But by G, if you're, you know, 5 or... 10% out in your GRV will make a huge difference. Oh, yeah. It, if you're over with your sale prices, it'll make a bad deal look good. If you're under, it could make a good deal not look good enough and mm. you might walk away from it. So mm. pretty important to get those those big numbers right. Yeah, that GRV number is probably that, – yeah. that's vital and that's that homework that people have to do, that due diligence to mm. understand what, what things are selling for. Yeah. And, and it can make a big difference on what you're prepared to buy your site for. Mm. Like, I had a look at one the other day. It was a three-townhouse project. It happened to be in New South Wales, but it doesn't really matter. It was a three-townhouse project. And I knew two people who were looking at that project. Yep. But they had a slightly different opinion on the GRV. They were pretty much in agreement on the construction price and, the, you know, consultants, council fees, all those sorts of things. But uh, one... One person thought that they would sell for 850000 Another person thought they would sell for 900000 
Now, it's a three townhouse project. So the GRV with one person is 150,000 higher than the, than the GRV of the other because mm-hmm. an extra 50,000 a townhouse over three townhouses. Now, all other costs being equal, and you're looking at a particular development margin you're trying to hit, let's say it was 18% or 20%. For, fin- for finance. For finance. For yep. finance, and to prove the, you know, the viability of the yep. project. What it means is that the person who had the higher GRV estimate by 150000 would be prepared to, to pay, pay around 150000 more. more for the site but still, by their calculations, get the same profit margin. And so that can be quite a difference. At an auction, for instance, mm. you could be at an auction and you worked out your site's worth 800000 and that's as much as you're going to bid. Somebody else, who in that example, would be prepared to pay 950 for mm. that site because they, in their calculations, they had a higher GRV. I think that really That's points the out. Make. Yeah, it just points out how vital it is to get your GRV right. Yeah, because it's it's such a big number. It's the biggest number. It makes the biggest difference. Which is doing that homework. You've got mm. to do the homework. Yeah, you have, and, and you've got and to look. And that's just not listening to one, looking at one sale, listening to one real estate agent. That I mean, we saw something pop up the other day for sale and it's being sold by an agent out of, out of that mm. particular area that it was for sale in and the agent's got no idea no but it's just looked roughly around oh even we've had valuations come in with <laughs> you, yeah i know just i'm just it. thinking that story uh. a re- evaluation valuation recently come in for a mentoring student that was miles off like mm, but mm. the valuer went on past prices of well over a year and a half ago he went on how he valued it looking at houses that weren't anywhere near it there were so many variables there it was just Mm. an update really it was a total mess and we ended up well i had to go to another valuer and that's not that easy either and And that triggers a whole lot of other things but anyway um that's that's what i mean so you don't you don't necessarily listen to the first person when it comes to um sale prices you need to do your homework yeah, and back to that, what I said earlier about working a patch. Yes. So if you've got a particular area that you're becoming an expert at, you would know everything that sells in that area. You would be keeping a log of it. You can use you know, things like Australian property data and RP data and those sorts of things to look up sales. Mm. Uh, you should be in contact with all the local agents. Anybody who's selling new products, uh, you know, agents, you should be in constant contact with them and when they sell something, or even if they sell off plant. You know, if an agent sells a property off plan, it might not show up on Australian property data, for instance, for six or 12 months mm. till oh, it really? settles. Is it that? Oh, of course. No one knows about it until it settles. Right, delayed settlement. Other settlements. than the agent and the purchaser and the seller, pretty right. much. Right. But by the time it comes out on Australian property data, for instance, it, it could be nine months old. And the market may have moved up or down since then. So it's not really necessarily relevant. But if somebody signed an off plan contract last week and you knew the agent, well, that would be different. That's a current sale. You buy that person a glass of wine or a beer. <laughs> Any excuse. And you yarn with them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, you know, you, ne- you need to understand the GRVs. That's really important. So where do people – so on from the five-minute fee, though, you've, done, you've, minute. Done, you've done those small calculations, your, your profit and loss, basically, mm. and you've decided, yeah, I'm moving forward with this. Now, Bob, this is something that we <clears throat> often – hear from people who don't really haven't learned how to do a feasibility properly a proper one Mm. and they don't always get it right because they don't really know enough about what they're doing i mean you spend a lot of time working you know showing people how to do a feasibility because that's really the number one takeaway you know it's covering all that due diligence stuff it's making sure that things do stack up as we say Mm. and i have to say as far as feasibilities go, I mean, you're a whiz and you would be after 38 years, one would hope, and you've built your own program. Another plug, we have a feasibility calculator you can buy or not. We're not phased by it. Jump on the website if you're interested. But you do a FISO on your big project that you've got going on at the moment for yep. the over 55 lifestyle uh, village. You do a feasibility every three months on that same project. So you keep going over that. Hmm. Updating it, yeah. Up to, so that's the level of experience, professionalism, 
that's what's required if you're doing something yeah. for those people doing something bigger. And some people start big straight away. Hmm. You really need to keep on top of it, hey? Yeah. And even if it's not big, that just reminded me what you just said is when you do your very first feasibility when you're looking at a project, what every item that you put in there, every dollar value is an estimate. Mm. When you've finished your project, everything is an actual. So you should be really constantly updating your feasibility. So you do the very first feasibility and you put the land value in at the asking price. Yep. But you might get it a little bit cheaper. Well, that's okay. You can now adjust that feasibility with that new figure. Mm. You know, the purchase price, stamp duty, adjust it, and things go on. Uh, your consultant's fees might be a little bit more, a little bit less than what you estimated. Well, put them in as, you know, as you find them out. And, and so what happens, it's, it's gone from all estimates and no actuals to all actuals and no estimates at the end and all those points in between, what you're really doing is substituting your actuals with your estimates. Now, if you've done a really good job, you should end up pretty much Bang. where you started. Yep. Unless something, for instance, a variation could be, and we've seen it, uh, bill costs can go up from the time you look at a site till the time you build it, but then sale prices can go up. Well, obviously, they can go down too, but and they so go can, up more than they go down. And so can build prices. Look yeah. at what you've just had a massive build price decrease. So, how well, good was that? Yeah, yeah. So, they get, that's not often, but that can happen. Yeah, well, that's because I'm conservative with my numbers as well, mm. but not conservative to the point of being silly of conservative. When that's the retirement village project you're referring to. Yeah. And uh, because it's, it's, a lot, it's 99 homes, uh, we, we did allow a bit of fat in the, in the construction price because we knew things were going up. But as it turned out, we, we ended up coming in about 8 or 9% below budget, which is a good thing when you do. Over 99 houses, that's pretty good. It, it adds up to about $3 million, I think. $3 million saving. Yeah. Not bad. That's on a budget. Good, on, yeah, on, but on budget. On budget. Uh, can I do another plug? I feel like I'm an advert today. I can't help myself. Human advert, <laughs> Hillary. Well, you are still taking on investors for that. I am the investor liaison officer. So if you are you, in charge of investors uh, in our organisation. If you're interested in hearing about opportunities we have available and we are offering uh, percentages on that one. So if you're interested in, in investing with us or other projects that we have on the go, feel free to reach out to me, Hillary at propertymastermind.com.au. I am a bit of an advert today. I don't mean to do this. Sorry, it wasn't in my plan, but hey. Oh, well, look, oh, if you want to invest in our projects opportunities are often there as you say yeah got some great opportunities mm. so bob what's the biggest problem on a real feasibility not the not the five minute one what's mm. the biggest error you see people making oh sometimes they they mess up the gst uh they don't i knew you were going to say that well <laughs> you often see round numbers people yeah. put up a feasibility it's just full of really round numbers five thousand ten thousand and I, and I immediately think, well, they're so round, they're probably guessing to a fair extent. And it's and this often leave out GST, mm. which is significant. I mean, that the GST is the equivalent, because not every cost has GST component, but overall, it's probably about 8% of your cost just by mu messing up the GST. Um, but those big, big numbers, bill costs, mm. again, a lot of people, when they're starting out, think, oh, I haven't got a clue about what something costs to build. Well... Within your patch, once again, you should be talking to any builder who starts building in your patch mm. and, and catching up with them and seeing what the construction price is on that. Uh, you can, you know, there's lots of ways you can talk to uh, quantity surveyors as well. But but builders are really where it's at. So, mm. so sometimes bill costs, um, or, or people getting conservative, this might sound a bit weird. Sometimes people uh, come to us, even within our program, and we ask, you know, we taught them how to do a feasibility. They do one, they put it up to us, and then we critique it, adjust it, get it right. That's what we do. And they say, oh, I've gone conservative. And I immediately think, why would you? Um, and they said, look, I, I think I think they'll sell for 800 but I'll put them in at 770 And I thought, okay. And they said, I, I, I think they'll cost, you know, uh, 320 to build, but I'll put them in at 350 to build. And so what you've done, you've just decreased your income side of it up, up. And they say, oh, it's only showing 13%. Well, the point is, if you were real, 
you know, that project might show the margin, whatever it's required, 16, 17, 18, mm. you know. And so you've got to be a bit careful, but then it's m- much more dangerous to go the other way and be bullish. And sometimes I've seen people who get emotionally involved in a site. Mm. It could be that they've looked for quite a while, been frustrated not finding one. They finally get one that sort of works in their mind, but then they make it better than it is. Mm. It's the reverse of what I just talked about. They think, well, I know they might cost you know three hundred and thirty thousand to build these things, but I reckon I can, you know, screw a builder down to, to three ten, and so I'm going to put my building at three ten, and I know they sell for about eight forty, but look, I reckon these are going to be really good, and uh, you know I'm going to get some points of difference. They're going to be really good, so I reckon no, they won't sell at eight ten. I reckon I'll get eight forty for them, and and they start loading things and. Or, you know, it might cost, it might take 10 months to build them, but I'm going to really work the builder over and, and get it done in seven. And so that, you know, reduces the interest. Mm. And next thing they've turned a very marginal, probably not really profitable enough deal into something that gets over the line. Mm. And and that that emotional involvement, not remaining analytical, I've seen people get into trouble doing that as well. Mm. But, Just on mm. uh, that timing, that really does affect... The interest rates at the moment, yeah. um, and, and you know, interest rates having slightly increased, whatever that is, she says, as in it doesn't really have too much of an impact, real a little bit, but yeah. but I mean, if that if that interest, uh, the cost of money, what I'm mm. talking about, mm. uh, that's an important figure in your feasibility, yeah, and. I, I know you use the, uh, you know, you've got your timeline that you use for when money's injected in and, you know, to calculate. All the cash flows we do. Yeah, so, the yeah, when you're not always paying for that money the whole time. And Mm. so I suppose that's another another aspect of feasibility that people don't really understand either. Finance is a big subject. Finance is such a big, because you don't borrow necessarily the whole lot at the start and if it's strict fed in, you're not paying the interest and all of that. Just on the, well, ideally on on the drawn down. Yeah. yeah. But that just, you just raise something then when you're talking about, obviously interest rates have gone up, so money is more expensive. Mm. But also build times are are quite a lot longer than they used to be. Mm, We were talking about that this morning, just Mm. due to China really. Well, yeah, it all happened with the supply chain. With COVID. And COVID, yeah, and the supply chain and and trying to get hold of supplies and timber and things out of China. I mean, it has improved a bit, but there's still a lot of factories that aren't producing much out of China. It's still slow to come over. It's uh, There's labour shortages because there's been a lot of building. And there's a whole heap of things going on. It is actually slightly improving. Mm. And I'm talking to builders who are saying, you know, they're finding it a bit easier to get trades, they don't have to wait as long to get their trades. Their materials are, are still a bit slow, but they're, they're better, you know, yeah. getting better. Uh, but what's happened is that interest rates gone up, which makes things a bit more expensive, but then bill times. Uh, you know, we've seen uh, people, well, builders quoting, you know, 10 or 11 months on a something like a duplex, where five years ago we were building nine-storey apartment blocks every nine months. And so... As a result, because it's the bill times longer, the the interest over a longer period builds up, and the higher interest rates. So, so that's uh, that's two two you negatives s- that are. You see that improving, like you just mentioned, yeah. it is getting better. But now I saw on the news whether that's true or not. I don't know if I trust the news, but yeah. I did see that uh, China has how many like sixty percent of China has COVID right now. So oh, is that the reason I, I that, the, that, that they're shut? Or I, I saw that last that the, last night. Actually. Yeah, yeah. And it, we watch the news is together. Tr- is it true? <laughs> don't we know, don't generally probably. watch it. But I think what I'm hearing is like everything just shut down basically over there, you know, during COVID, and and factories have opened up, but they're, they're not at full production, and they're nowhere near full production. Of course, transport got really expensive. That's the price of a of a um, containers come back uh, not to what it was but but look basically if we just talk about the whole supply chain which is both materials and labor mm. it is improving nowhere near back to what it was pre-covid but mm. but improving because we've had a lot of construction and a big lift in the market so everybody's been busy uh and so you know that slowed things down but it, it's not to a point where a lot of trades are, you know, looking for work. A lot of builders are looking for work. Although we have met a few builders recently. Uh, that That's a change you and I have noticed, is that they're getting holes in their program during 2023. I mean, last year they just chocked out. A lot of builders just said, I can't even talk to you for six months. 
whereas now they're, they're starting to get holes in their programs. Mm. Uh, and some builders are actually building faster than they thought. Which is great. Yeah, I mean, you were at a site yesterday. Yes. Which, which I just couldn't believe bang. the progress, Bob. Mm. Started in, well, pre-Christmas in December, and then, like, the slabs down, the, the swimming pools in the back are down. And if the, the uh, garages are up. Yeah, and party walls, blocks up. You yeah. know, all, all this work, just the block work just went bang, you know. And that, was, that was very quick. I can't, I'm going to mm. go back, have a, a sort of maybe on Friday and see how fast. I hope it's not one of those ones. It goes fast, it goes slow. It goes fast, it goes slow. No, they're pretty well on top of it. And, yeah. and, and this builder that on that project is expecting to finish well ahead of his program, which suits the builder perfectly because they get that amount of money quicker. Yeah. Instead of getting, you know, X dollars over a 12-month contract, if he can do it in eight, he gets X dollars in eight months. So that's yeah, that's a lot better than 12 and then gets him onto that's other jobs quicker. That's a great way to look at it, Bob. And I, I suppose a lot of people don't look at it like that. I'd never looked at it like that. That's really, yeah, that's a great way to look well, at it. Well, it enables them to, to turn their money over quicker yeah. and get onto more jobs. There you go. You yeah. heard it here first. So, some builders have often <laughs> said to me, oh, will you give me a bonus if I finish early? And I said, if you finish early, you, you're already getting a bonus, brother yeah. <laughs> or sister. <laughs> no, I, don't, I, I haven't seen it. There's, I don't know if we've got any guild builders on any sites of ours at the moment. Not, no, I don't not know at the moment, no. There, no there, not are yet. A, there are a couple of female builders around. Well, Bob, I think we could, we could summarise episode 84. Yeah. A few things. Well, a few things. I, I, I guess to come out of it is... Um, do a quick feasibility like the one I mentioned, the five-minute one with the income and the eight costs. And just the whole point of that, it, you wouldn't buy it off a five-minute feasibility, but it, it sort of tells you, well, it's looking okay. I should spend more time on it. But if it looks bad, better to kill it quickly. Mm. Don't waste time on it. And I guess the other thing to come out of it is the three big numbers typically in, in a construction-type project are the GRV, by far the biggest, but construction and land, they're the three you really got to get right. And we've seen what an incredible effect uh, the GRV number has mm. on, the, on the financial outcome of a project and how critical it is to get, to get those numbers right. Yeah, some great nuggets of gold. Thanks, yeah. Bob, for your wisdom yeah. again. It's so important. Of all the people I've seen get into trouble over the last almost 40 years, and I bump into people and sometimes people phone us even out of the blue, it's nearly always they get the numbers wrong. Yeah. Sometimes it's a feasibility thing. They bought a block of land that floods and they didn't know or something. But yeah. but I mean generally it you know, that's the problem. They they get all the numbers wrong. They've tried to bumble their way through or, you know, think you can learn all that stuff on the internet or something. I don't know what they do, but and then, and then they become educators. <laughs> Some do, yeah. Yes. Well, uh, that's another story. <laughs> anyway. So yeah, that's that's I think they're the main takeaways. All right, people, we hope you found that useful. If you are interested in chatting to us about what we offer, like I said, reach out. And we'd love for you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and make sure you give us some love somewhere, uh, whether, you've, whether you're on our Facebook pages or wherever you are that you might follow us. We love hearing, hearing back from you and maybe hearing what it is you'd like to hear from us. We'll catch you next week for episode 85. See ya. Bye, yeah.